Thank you for having the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the story that kept me busy for the last five years. Um, maybe I should, I wanted, I thought I'd start a little bit earlier. I started sort of at a time when I was basically in a similar situation like you. I was also starting my career as a scientist, actually in the area of bioinformatics, like some others. Uh, which at the time was not even a discipline, it was called computational biology. It was very theoretical, we were sort of looking at protein structures and calculating sort of artificial trajectories which were sort of probably still far away from reality because there was no water around, it was all in vacuum. So it was very theoretic and uh, it was very interesting, it was cool, uh, but uh, at EMBL at some point, we had developed some methods, some approaches, which uh, were also interesting for others. So f I was, uh, it was until that time, I always had a very complicated uh, speech to give if somebody was asking me, what are you doing? It was something that was light years away from that everyday life. But at that time, the genome sequencing came up People had some idea about genomes, about sequencing, about sort of the, the bacteria that we were working with. So suddenly our bioinformatics analysis was solving a problem that somebody really in the lab was having and was really sort of trying to solve. And uh, that was sort of the start of a transition for us. That was actually also the start uh, that was accompanied with some mental changes when I was thinking, why should I finance all my research just by sort of public money from people who may or may not like what I'm doing. Why not finance my research by people who pay because they want to buy my product, they want to buy the thing that I have produced, they want to buy my results and they need it and they use it. So that was something that I found very intriguing and maybe some of you sometimes have the same ideas in the back of your mind. And what I'm trying to show you is that this is not an absurd idea, it can happen in reality. So, that has been a long time ago. I'll now jump uh, to the last five years. And let me first map out a little bit where are we going. So I'm talking about founding a company. So the first idea is about what is it that I want to have, what I want to achieve if I found a company. Um, the question is, what is a solid company? Uh, a solid company has a number of ingredients that you need that are required to really have it work properly. It should not be sort of a, a thing that sort of burns shortly and then is, is dead. It's something that needs to be solid and functioning. So in order to be successful, you need something that is required on the market. You need a good product. And for most of us, this means that this is something that is based on good science, on solid science, on solid technology. So that is one of the requirements because then you are sort of competitive to the rest of the world. It's also that we always stand up against the rest of the world. I think the times when our competitors were in Graz and in Linz, they are gone. We are sort of in a global game and that is something that we have to face from day one. And what we have to know is that what, even if it's the most beautiful science, it has to be something that other people want to buy, that there is a real need, there's a real market for it. That's the requirement for a functioning company. But then, it is here is number two, but I think you cannot really say it's number two, a good team. So you need very good people with who are doing this because things are changing. And if, if, even if the best ideas, you start off with the very best idea, um, you need people who are always alert, always watching, always moving things and adapting things because we learn more, things are changing and you, will, you know it from your daily scientific work. And then the last thing are sort of the standard things of a company. You need a functioning, solid, good organization, not quite slim, quite efficient, and it has to do the standard things of a company. It's the finance, intellectual property, legal things, sales and marketing, very important because if you don't sell your products, you're not gonna make it. You keep your, your team busy, and you're not only busy, but you keep it happy, because why should they work and do good work if they are not happy? They will never do it. 
and sort of something that also is uh, for scientists a new area you have to do quality assurance production processes it's a bit of a new area at least for me that we have to go into but that is sort of the goal where we are going so what is it when we start so what are the requirements to start a company and that is sort of much smaller it's only a f I have three points I think that are critical one of them is that instead of a good technology you just need a good idea you need to have something that makes sense and you develop the technology you develop the science around it but it has to be an idea that would lead to what I had as a product before the good team you need from day one you need people who will do this who will translate this idea in reality and the last thing last not least like everything in our life you need solid financing if you have the best idea and the best team if the company doesn't survive until, to, until this idea is reality the, the company is dead and that is actually sort of the major cause of death of biotechnology companies after two years many of them are gone it's not because they had bad ideas not because they had bad people it's really because they couldn't afford it anymore so that is something that if you start off you better check very well if you can survive until this really the, the success will kick in so now I will sort of show you one example which is our example it's not the typical example but it's probably not untypical either and go through these different steps how this led to a company that is now sort of relatively solid here in Austria actually when I came to Austria biotechnology was still sort of a very rare event and one of my major motivations was to show you don't have to go it's not only Boston or anywhere sort of Cambridge where you can start a real good company you can also do it in Austria why not and you will see that there are a lot of very good uh, conditions here in Austria among them of course there's a lot of talent so we start off with an idea this is 2009 it's a historical photo uh, it has uh, in the back you see the the general hospital of Vienna sort of if you would walk over there to the right there's the center of molecular medicine and this was an event where Tyn Brummelkamp here in the center the tallest he's a Dutch guy he gave us a seminar yeah Do you mind if I turn off the no I think that's what we tried before but I think I, I cannot I do it Ah, okay yeah <laughs> tiny is more pretty than I am so I, it's, I think it's a good idea okay so this is the inventor of the fundamental technology he gave a seminar at the Center of Molecular Medicine and he showed us data and the technology that we were all excited about it was an op a possibility to do genetics in human cell lines and he showed incredible results and incredible successes with that technology so we all got very very excited about it and it was one particular idea that we found extremely <laughs> extremely exciting about it it was that that suddenly would have allowed us to create a collection of identical cell lines which are let's say twins except for a single gene so one gene we can knock out the rest is identical so now now we can check particular hypotheses for the function of a particular gene by just having that one gene knocked, knocked out or not and see if now a particular pathway is on is functioning or not if a particular phenotype is there or not so we found that very exciting I also found it very exciting because it's not a, an endless task we knew that there's only 20,000 genes so after 20,000 such actions we are there and nobody can actually pass us anymore we will have done it all and just sort of have it as a research tool available the other two founders this is Sebastian Neumann who is also a was a scientist at SEM at the time he's now in Oxford and Julius Opertifurga who is uh, the director of SEM so we worked on this idea and while discussing this idea Tyne said yeah I'm using this technology it's working very well and I found 
a target, a protein, and if you, ta if you sort of uh, can inhibit the target, it will protect cells from virus infections. Well, that sounds also very interesting to us. So we had actually not one, we had two ideas to start with, which is not always probably a good idea to start with two goals, but we could not resist. So that's what we did. We set off to get that going. So we had point one. Point two, who is going to do it? None of these would give up their lab, that was clear. I was not the one to run these experiments. Ah, yeah, maybe just a few words about the technology, just to illustrate it a little bit. I mean, so the idea is to have genetic experiments, genetic screens done in human cells, which has never worked before, always because you have the second copy on the second chromosome. So whenever you do a knockout, there's a second copy there that is interferes, that you see no clear phenotype, things don't show clear results. Um, the nice thing would be if we had human cell lines with a single chromosome. Usually those cells are not very stable, but in the literature Tyne found this one cell line that actually had a nearly haploid genome. So it was ideal. He sort of did a lot of technology development, but now he can do genetic screens and experiments in this cell line where a single hit on a, gene, on a, on a chromosome or a gene will immediately show you the phenotype about that mutation. This, yeah? How long has the cell line been around, i.e.? Ah, it, it has been originally described, I think, in some time about 98, 99. Then it was sitting in the liquid nitrogen tank for about 10 years until Tyne dug it out, asked for it, and sort of built the whole technology around it. Has it changed? It's, I mean, I think it has been just sitting there at minus 150. But of course now we're using it a lot, we have to be very careful that it sort of doesn't drift away. Yeah. So these cells are very well described. We have sequenced it, we have looked at all the protein of it. Uh, a lot of screens have been done with this cell line. So it's a very good and uh, consistent basis for our research. And of course, if we find some phenomenon that is actually relevant in a different context, we can validate in a different context, but this is a very efficient and straightforward way to get your starting point of research. So we sort of manage the business model for the company. You see you have the knockout cell lines, that is what we want to produce. Then we will use the knockout cell lines and the cells to do genetic screens. And then when we find an interesting target, we would enter the early stages of drug discovery. So we would look for something, a therapeutic, with, that would then treat that particular disease conditions. In our case, it would be a virus infection. It's, when we thought about it, we thought, okay, here we can probably make some business by selling those clones. Actually, at the time, those were not available at all. So this was the only way for academics to get those cell lines. As a, as a company, you could buy them for 20,000 bucks, uh, but for an academic, that was completely out of reach. So with this technology, because it's very efficient, we could offer them for 1,000 bucks. So we thought that could be attractive, but we didn't know if it works when we started off. The second part could also be a product, or at least a business by sort of offering this and making a little bit of money and surviving the company. And that is something that would only make money once we have reached a, a proof of concept that would really sort of make it attractive to a pharma partner or a partner in biotech industry who would sort of give us money for a drug candidate. So, step two, we need somebody who does it. This is May 2010, when Julio uh, convinced his best postdoc to join the company and sort of abandon his academic career. It's a big step. I think he has never uh, been unhappy about it, but of course it was not an easy step for him. <coughs> and it took a few years until he sort of really thought, well, ah, it's probably the right way to go. Uh, he is actually sort of the key driver about translating this idea into a real functioning technology and, uh, and, uh, and uh, business well so and the last thing is solid financing we needed the money 
we found, uh, I would say, a veteran of biotechnology. I, his name is Gustav Amarer. He has been one of the very few people in Austria who has actually made a lot of money in biotechnology. He has been in the US, uh, one of the very first people working in um, ah. Oof, what is the company? In an American biotech company. No, it is. It was. Um, I'll remember it later. <laughs> but uh, he, he sort of stepped in at the point when we just had the idea. We didn't have anything to show. But he, as a scientist, saw the potential, and as a yeast geneticist, he saw the fantastic opportunity opening up with haploid genomes, and he immediately jumped in. And he is actually sort of the reason why we could have this team mm. working. Here we are, sort of, this is the day when we went to the notary to found the company in 2010. So, and now it's about making this work. Uh, yeah, at this point, maybe I want a little philosophical excursion because at this point you start to negotiate about who is getting how much of the company and who is, has contributed how much and what is it worth and so on. And uh, a very solid and clean basis is the reason for success later on. So this team, the five, as we stand here on this picture, we still stand together as friends. We are still happy. We are still supporting this company. It's because we have sort of gone after that simple rule, which means it's not important if I get 12 or 13 or, tw or 11 percent of the company. If the whole thing is successful, I should, I'm, I'm going to be happy. If the whole thing is not going to work, 13% is as good as 12%. It doesn't really make a difference. So the real difference is in making it work and not sort of trying to have a relatively better deal and have a sort of a more uh, better representation of the individual contributions. So it is some rule that I have seen working many, many times. The real sort of challenge is to make it work. The other things are sort of side battles where you can lose a lot of time and destroy a lot of uh, good energy. So now we start to build a company. Now we have to start them to build it step by step. So the first thing is the good product. We need the technology and we have to show it works. Um, the technology, and this is sort of a bit unusual, it was not the same technology, it was the technology it was invented at the Whitehead Institute of MIT in Boston. So we had to first get a license to be able to make a company based on it. It was not so easy to go to Boston and convince them that Vienna, Austria, the center of molecular medicine is the right place to do this and not Boston, MIT, Harvard. So it was a hard and long uh, negotiation. It took us uh, a year until we got finally a signature on it. And uh, it was the first but important step to get it done. This was sort of the basic of technology. We have three licenses, one for each of these three business ideas. So one technology to build these products and uh, sell knockout clones. One of them to do genetic screens as a, as a service and one of them to get this target, this antiviral target, and develop anti-infective therapeutics. Here you see me a bit uh, exhausted but happy after a year of negotiations. This is the contract which is signed now by both sides. So now things could start. Actually, another sort of little story. If we would have waited until we have the last signature on this paper, we would have probably, we would still not be anywhere. At some point, you have to take a bit of risk. So let's say halfway through, we started to become active. Um, this is a bit of a risk that you have to take. But if you don't take risks, uh, you will not make it. So that means that the next step, which is building the team, we started before this signature. Probably that's one of the reasons why I start to have a lot of gray hair. The other thing is, I'm sorry, I apologize that this is in German. It slipped in. Um, you need a supportive environment. As a startup company is a, a tiny little seed plant 
seedling and it's very sensitive. So you need an environment that is really supportive, otherwise it's very difficult to make it go on. So SEM as an environment has been very critical. I'll come back to that in a moment. But also the environment in, in Vienna and Austria has been very supportive. And in particular, I have to do, sort of mention this agency, the technology agency of Vienna, who support research-based industry, research-based companies. And so once you do that, there is actually a lot of support here. And that is very good. It's very nice. It's not that they say, ah, very bad that you are trying to do something. It's they support and they, they, they help you wherever they can. And this particular one has been very important because they said, we believe in your idea. It's an idea, but we believe that you will do it. And we give you some money to support you. Uh, Sam, oh, this was the wrong one. Uh -huh. SEM has been I important in several aspects. It has been an institution where we could sort of concentrate on the few critical things in the, the beginning, which is the proof of concept of our technology, and not have to deal about having a functioning printer, having a functioning finance department, having a functioning pur purchase department. Uh, where can I get a centrifuge? How can I do my, my uh, uh, tissue culture? All this we used. Uh, in the context of SEM in these early days, until we knew things do really work the way we thought they would. Um, the second thing with SEM was important for us is also that by joining forces, say that we, had a, we built a private-public partnership, which means that we built this clone collection for the benefit of both for the SEM, who wants to use it for their research, and for us to build up a business around it later on. SEM is also a shareholder of Haplogen. So whenever Haplogen is going very well, it's very good for SEM. It's also, I think, a fair thing. And it's, I'm very happy about that. And uh, the last thing, which is also very important in our particular setting, is that SEM has a compound screening facility. So once we got the target, you need some way to find out, is that target really some protein that you can inhibit with compounds? Is there a way to block that protein? Is the protein doing what you think? So there, this compound screening facility is a, was a critical component of being able to run this last bit of our company with limited <coughs> resources that we had. So now we have, we build up the team. You see, in the initially, we sort of had just a bench, a, a meter of bench and the two first employees. This is probably January 2011. Uh, about uh, half a year later, we moved in this incubator lab. And we even had our own logo already. So that was a big event for us, a big celebration. Uh, so you see the team growing from the first three in January. This is maybe July. And that's already December. So the team has grown very rapidly. Here you see that within the first year, we already have tested a lot of compounds, if they do anything on our target. And uh, yeah, the team has really become a, a little company. So now it's time. It's like, uh, let me see if I'm not jumping too fast. But uh, it's, it's like, like at home, you, you grow and you grow in the house of your father and your mother. At some point, uh, they say, now you go and have your own apartment. It's becoming a bit tricky. You don't want to run into sort of arguments, into sort of conflicts. So at some point, you have to build up the organization as a real organization that has their own financing, their own facilities, their own responsibilities. So that was coming within the next two slides. The first thing I want to mention is that Again, it's a, you need to look for partners that complement your capabilities. In our case, we felt strong in biology. We felt strong in, uh, in this compound screening. But then when it goes about chemistry, we had no expertise. And we also thought it's not worth building up a whole team for not knowing if we are getting there. So there, we started a collaboration with Evotech, a medicinal chemistry company, 
that had a whole team of chemists sitting there, they were experienced, they knew what they were doing, and that has been a real boost to our project. And the second thing is that our drug discovery has now been uh, very well supported by the uh, Forschungsförderungsgesellschaft, by the research support facility in Vienna, which allowed us to go with full speed. And it's also th something that there are particular areas, and I think in particular drug discovery is an area where slow, slow is never gonna work. You have to go either full speed or you will be s surpassed by all the other ones. You are in a race with the others and the others don't wait for you. So this, we just had to sort of get as many resources, put it into that project and see how quickly can we come to a compound that really works. So here we move into our own facilities. Um, this is when we had to stand our, on our own feet and it is probably not so dissimilar from when you move out of the house of your parents. Suddenly you have to wash your laundry and you have to cook for yourself. So we also had some very tough times here when our money was running really low and we had to see how do we survive to the next month and how do we pay the bills and which bills is, can we pay a month later. So this is quite a critical phase. So when you start to really be on your own, you see people are still happy. Um, and the other nice thing is here we moved into the campus of the Vienna Biocenter and there it's like if you move maybe into the student hostel, you're not alone. There are all people around you or companies around you that have the same fate. So you can share experiences. They also had to find a, a tax lawyer. They also had to find an auditor. They also had to find a lawyer for license agreements and so on. So that is a fantastic environment uh, where you can really share your experiences. They share their experiences with us. And uh, that's very, very helpful. And it's also quite... Um, comforting because you see that you're not the only one who is have to having to solve all those problems. Um, yeah, so I'm now focusing a little bit on these clones, on these knockout clones. By being able to produce them on a reliable basis, uh, we had better set up a whole process. We had actually established all the requirements for running a business. Maybe one little side comment here. In the meantime, a technology revolution had happened. So we were doing this with, uh, gene with uh, insertion mutagenesis, but suddenly there was the CRISPR technology. It's a technology that allows you to really do a, f a dedicated, clear, focused um, uh, mutagenesis in, in genes. And it could actually now Theoretically, at least, everybody could make their own mutations and knock out genes, knock out uh, mutants. So it could have been a sort of uh, a, a death sentence to us. Fortunately enough, we jumped on the technology right away. And within very short, we had a, a huge collection of knockout genes and actually have the whole pipeline running. So whenever somebody wanted to have a knockout, theoretically, we already had it because we could produce it within two months. So that is something that was far faster than anybody else could do it. So this was a critical phase where this whole thing could have broken down. Uh, it also shows that uh, whenever you are active in the area of technology, things are moving very rapidly and you always have to be alert and ready to move and, and to change. So, but still we had a unique position. We had at least theoretically, the complete coverage of the whole genome. We could offer any knockout except for those that kill the cells. And uh, the next thing is, how do we sell those? How do you get to the customer? And there are sort of two potential ways to do that. Uh, one of them is you go for a distribution partner. There are very established companies, Thermo Fisher, some of you know them very well, Sigma and so on. They go to everybody, sell them their products and if you can start a partnership they will distribute your products then you may have access to a global customer base right away the disadvantage is that they are usually taking a big piece of the pie they take at least 30 percent of what you pay stays with them so what would have ended up with us is a very small piece the second thing that is not here is that they are usually big organizations so they move slow 
you want to be quick. So it's also not a big advantage. Uh, the last thing is that then, in the end, you are dependent. If they perform well, it's good. But if they don't perform well, you have nothing. You're sort of dead because somebody else didn't do their job properly. So you have to wait. But on the other hand, it's less work. Uh, an alternative that is sort of now open to us, we, we started to do a web shop. It's quite inexpensive. You have it programmed. It's an established technology. It works very well for Amazon. It works very well for Zalando. Why shouldn't it work for us? It's fast. It's efficient because people put in their order wherever they are. We immediately have it in our production pipeline. We can work on it. Uh, it's global. Everybody in the world can order a clone here. And we have a direct contact to the customer. It's not that there is, we don't know who is actually ordering it. We know exactly who is ordering it. We get the feedback. We understand what they want. We understand if they have a problem. So it's actually a very nice thing. So then we went for that, obviously. So we built up, this you see is a, is a simple uh, web shop. And we could immediately have a customer base within two months that was a global customer base. Uh, within the years, we have made it a bit more pretty. Here you see the uh, collection of all uh, kinase uh, genes with the knockouts that are all available. So you just click on it and you can order it. And you have other sort of ways to get at our products. But uh, it worked very, very well. We were immediately globally present. And then in the every Monday, FedEx comes in. We pack all our clones on dry ice, send them out. And they are in the con yeah. Maybe you're going to say something about that, but how did people know about it? Yeah, that's a very good point. That's my next point. <laughs> very good point. So how do you how do you get? We, I talked about the sales channels, but how do you enter the market? And there, we thought the following. We thought that our customers are actually scientists. What do you trust as a scientist? You don't trust the company brochure. You don't trust uh, videos on some somewhere. What you only, the only thing you really trust is a solid r scientific publication. So what we worked for the last year and why we actually delayed the market entry for months and months, it was very painful. People were very, very sort of uh, frustrated. We wanted to have a publication out. So before the publication is out, we didn't want to open our web shop. Uh, and you know, then the review process takes forever. But that's what we did. So we got a publication in Nature Methods. And that made us immediately visible. And that was actually the starting point after which, within two months, we had uh, customers over, I think, three to four continents. Um, so I think you really have to think very well how to make that product known. And, uh, and for us, if you are in the, in the market of scientists, it's scientific publications. So at that point, we thought that this part is actually working pretty well. It's actually quite kind of established. This one is an, a never ending story. It takes 10 years. We know drug discovery takes forever. It's a very complicated story. Why don't we make our life simple? We have sort of two parts. Let's split the company in two. One of them focuses on a simple story on scientists who want to have tools for their research. One of them focuses to develop drugs against diseases on the long term to do something for the patients. That's what we did. So here another sort of background. So where do you want to have these companies to go? What do you want? Uh, so there are basically two potential outcomes that may make you happy. Uh, one of them, I think it's very nice to see a company that really works. It's like a machine. It's like building a clock. Things work. It sort of it produces money. It, it grows. It cre creates revenues. They have employees. It, they are happy. It's actually something that is very satisfying. So it's one way. You build a company that grows and grows and is successful, and uh, watch it and support it to grow very well. And of course, the other one, which is also not so rare is that you say, well, at a certain point, I sell that company and uh, try to m do something else with the money that is coming. Hopefully, it's more than I have spent up to the point. Um, in fact, we were 
mainly thinking about this, and we were trying to optimize the processes, we were trying to optimize everything that was sort of happening. We sort of had uh, developed our product, we were thinking about new products, we had the customers that were coming back and asking for more clones. Um, we had a unique selling point because uh, our technology was very efficient, and so nobody could actually compete for that price. We had enormous growth potential. This is sort of what happened in the first sort of few months. Um, I wonder where the publication came out. I, th I think it was even here. <laughs> so you see, uh, it, it uh, starts very low, and you have to be very sort of patient to see this really go up. Um, it's, it's a technology that is very widely useful, so you can have uh, developed new uh, markets, new customers, and uh, we had set up patents to secure the basis of that so that others could not move into our space very easily. And by having done that, we became an attractive target for acquisition. So then we were contacted by Horizon Discovery. This is a British company, basically in a similar market, but without that technology base. And they saw there are a lot of assets, and that is so something that once you think about exit, you have to make sure that these are sort of properly done. Patents, a customer base, technology and processes, which means know-how, an experienced team, and also we had sort of built up some reputation uh, in the scientific community. So that uh, we started to negotiate with them. And again, a little philosophical excursion at that point. Um, negotiations, it's a similar point as they had before. So when you negotiate, it's again, you know, do you get a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more? Um, in principle, these negotiations can take forever because, as you see here, you can always go one digit further and negotiate for the next digit, and every digit is about the same effort. So it's, it's much more intelligent to quickly get the basic picture right and then not bother too much if the basic picture is, f is functioning, you have done the whole job and you spend a lot less resources also to the lawyers and also your own time and your nerves. And, and, uh, so simple deal structures are usually the best. They give you the best benefit. It's a little bit more like, like this 80-20 rule. It's, you have to probably be a bit more precise than 80-20, but uh, you should not try to sort of optimize these last digits also, uh, it will not give you much benefit. So fortunately, both sides were going into these negotiations with similar uh, philosophies. So we, the deal was closed in three months, which is quite fast. Uh, for example, if you compare to signing the simple sort of uh, license deal uh, before, that took us a year, and a year is not unusual in any negotiations. Uh, it was a, a deal where we got sort of cash and shares, which means that uh, you get money, but then you get shares in that company, which have a risk. They can go up, they can go down, but it's sort of you bind your fate to the fate of Horizon. Um, and then they said, well, if in the next years you are doing as well as you promise, you get more money. So there was quite a risk also on our side if what we had projected is actually sort of realistic or if we ju were just sort of making up blue numbers. What happened immediately is that the, uh, that the Vienna site was secured. Now the financial basis was safe. They had uh, financial resources and strengthened. Um, here you see uh, the CEO of uh, Horizon smiling because he knows he has he's done a very good deal and me also very happy because we also think we have done a good deal. Um, what has changed? Basically, here you see the same web shop. The color has changed, but it's running. It continues running. But for us, it's fantastic. We moved into new labs, or also Horizon moved into new labs. They have grown. They have, of course, the new style and uh, the new jobs. So things are going uh, forward. And so that was actually a very nice thing to do. Um, the, no the other point that I want to show is that uh, this whole deal was based a little bit on promise. They said, you know, you tell us this is going to very well, but who knows what's coming. Yeah? Uh, so 
We were very curious to see what will happen this year. There are no official numbers out yet, but I can sort of do my, from the half year's calculations, what will be the numbers of the next year. So I think they did a good deal with us. We think uh, it's the potential is there, and I think there's still quite a lot of potential in that particular uh, products because I think uh, knockout genes, knockout clones are very versatile and, and good to use. So what is Hubblegen doing now? Hubblegen can now focus really on this drug discovery uh, business. So we do, uh, we work together with medicinal chemistry partners. We synthesize compounds. We check them in biochemical assays. We check if they are protecting our cells against viruses. So here you see uh, with and without compound, with, without compound, uh, this is a fluorescent virus. Uh, all these cells light up because the virus is sort of multiplying like crazy. The compounds do protect them. Uh, so if that works, then you go back. You, we can do structural biology. We can measure co-crystals. We can see how are the interactions between those compounds and the protein itself. Um, if the compound is good enough, you can start to understand what happens in a whole organism and then optimize the parameters again. You go a few cycles until you have something that is good enough that you think you can go into preclinical development, which means that you prepare all the pieces that justify going into uh, clinics and test it in first in volunteers and then in patients. So we are currently here somewhere um, and we think we will probably be here within the next year, which is exciting because it's a long way. As we started in 2010, five years of work until we entered that cycle. And now finally we think we see the light at the end of the tunnel, at least this particular light. Um, so now Haplogen has a very simple profile. We, we are uh, a company which is anti-infectives. I don't have to tell many stories. It's a simple story. We have a proprietary technology. We can still use the technology. It's very efficient to find host factors that are required for viruses. And uh, we have sort of a deal. We have some uh, history to show. This here is the campus Vienna Biocenter. This is the building uh, of Varneva. We are here on the first floor. Uh, this is where we have been before. It was a little shed. Uh, this is the university, this is the IMP, and if you would move on, there would be IMBA. So it's a great campus. There's a lot of biotech companies around in this building and sort of behind that building. Um, so we are very happy there. And I hope we continue to be happy there for a long time. Yeah, so maybe before I finally close, two more things. So. If I look around, uh, what about you? Um, I think it's, uh, I look old, but you don't have to be old to start a company. Most of the real successful entrepreneurs, they started young. So uh, the ones that we know well is Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, but also Edison and Siemens, they started really young. They always see them with a beard and as old men, but when they started, they were under 30. So it's the time when you can do these things. So. Whenever y you feel that could be interesting, don't wait and don't hesitate. Um, and uh, this is another sort of quote from Mark Twain. There is no problem if it doesn't work out. Uh, you don't have to be sort of worried. Uh, it, uh, it's always worth a try. Huh? Yeah, maybe a very, very last slide. Of course, these are all things that don't happen in isolation. There's a lot of partners, a lot of support uh, I've mentioned SEM, which is very important. I've mentioned the technology agency. Uh, we go have gotten support from Austria Wirtschaft Service, Evotech, FFG. Toolgen is a company that ha we have worked together in building up that uh, knockout clone collection. And of course, there's a whole team behind it. Uh, this is an old slide because uh, in the meantime, we have multiplied and don't have a slide where everybody's on it. Uh, in the meantime, those are actually two companies but uh, we share offices and it's still a, a nice environment. And of course, they are all the designers of Haplogen. Thank you.